Hey guys, welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. The website is offplanetradio.com. And I'm here tonight with Randy Moggins, and we have a special guest that uh, we're going to, Randy's going to introduce in just a second. But I just wanted to thank all of you guys who have been supporting us on Patreon. Things are going well. And um, uh, we're loving putting out the extra material for those who are supporting us. And um, yeah, if you haven't signed up yet, head on over to let Patreon. Me just, let me just jump in here for a minute. There's something I need to address. It Ooh. just came to my attention today. Okay. Um, as many people know, there's been a PayPal on the offplanetradio.com website for years. And some of you have availed yourselves of that over time and used it to support, sometimes rather generously. So in thinking about this and realizing that I, I believe a few of you have already jumped over and gone on to Patreon, that's cool. We have a record of people that made donations. And what, what I'm going to do is as we roll out the current program, I will work in those of you who have generously supported me over the last few years with contributions, and you'll be a partaker in some of the things that we're going to offer as well. So uh, just know that that's out there. Feel free to do however you want to do this. We don't formally have a program yet, but we'll work. I'm working on it right now in the background to integrate donations and the Patreon program. But I want to, I want to stress that the Patreon is what keeps us alive because it's a monthly support. So it's kind of important, but again, I can never say enough. Thank you for the, the donations, the support, the prayers, the travailing of tears that you've had over the years and things that we've done. It's all awesome. And uh, so having said that, if there's any questions about it, free, feel free to email me via the website and uh, we can talk about it. Okay. Our guest for tonight joins us from the regions of the Hudson Valley in New York state and from the nether worlds of places deep and mystical. He works as a hereditary Striga shaman. He's gonna tell you a little bit about that. He's a poet, musician, mystic, and dream seer. He previously appeared with us and our friend Laura Lada Leone in mid-August of this year. Yep. And uh, he has hosted the long-running show Spiral Radio and Para X Radio Network. And he now has this brand new show he runs on, that runs on Saturday night on our friend Chris and Cherie's network, Truth Frequency Radio. It's called The Eye of Ra. And our guest tonight is Ra Castaldo, from whom we expect nothing but the unexpected. Ra, welcome, my friend. <laughs> Thank you for that amazing introduction, everybody. Um, I'm really, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, and I really appreciate it. And it's my honor to spend some time, you guys, and, and see what we could come up with and where we can go down. Let me Thank ask you. If, Thank you, Randy. Let me ask you first off to explain a little bit about the. And I probably didn't. Did I pronounce it right? Strega, Strega, Strega yeah, Strega. Shaman, Strega, Shaman. Yeah. And that's that has to do with your ethnic background and your 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 heritage and your genetics. So, explain a little bit of that because that's kind of central to your narrative. Yeah, I mean, it's it's embedded in who I am. It's in my genetic memory. It's in my DNA. Um, and you know. What a striga is, it basically um, an, an Italian shaman, if you want to put it that way. I mean, there's there's dark shaman and there's good shaman. So there's all different types of strega. Um, my specific line um, originated in what is now Tuscany, um, Volterra. It's a Etruscan lineage. And mm -hmm. after time, they were basically hunted down by the church for hidden knowledge that they knew and certain things that they unlocked within themselves. And they had to go towards, um, they ended up in Benevento, Italy, where another revival of this hidden knowledge was taking place. And then from there, um, the Vatican had imprisoned certain leaders of the revival and they ended up going towards Naples from there. So it's, it's been 
thousands and thousands of years passed down through my hereditary line. And it's not just something that's passed down like um, books and, and stories. It's abilities that's passed down through the DNA, passed down through the genetic memory of who you are. And if a certain person is chosen or maybe even agreed in this incarnation to be the inheriting and the one that inherits the, the these abilities it gets stronger and stronger and stronger each and every time and my specific family their abilities have to do with being dream seers and traveling in spirit time or or dream time and certain prophetic dreams and learning how to find the little synchronicities in life and making them be magic and opening up um, the portals within yourself and the hidden realms within yourself and within nature and everything around you. So in the course of all that, your own, own personal unfolding to all of this, this will bring us into what we sort of discussed pre-show a little bit, but the awakening that you underwent and your understanding of your, her, your heritage and your gifting and also your destiny. So, Tell us how, kind of unpack how that unfolded to you. You know, um, that's, that's a long story too. And, um, you know, to, I guess in everybody's life, I, I feel that there's a spiritual blueprint. There's all these spiritual timelines that are laid out for you at birth. And you get polarized towards them, whatever little things that happen or, or little synchronicities, like I, like I pointed out to you, that you see or notice in this lifetime will lead you down these timelines during your incarnation. And I feel that we are all sort of like time coded in a way to like awaken to certain things or remember certain things at certain key moments in our life. And um, for me, it was... You know, you know, there's a lot, a lot of things that I think too that that take place in people's lives. Like um, this dark force that I feel has hijacked our planet for hundreds of thousands of years um, has arranged religion and certain things. Just like when someone's a child, the whole ordeal of going through baptism and getting your third eye or your consciousness programmed and altered with witchcraft and rituals um i think that we lose things at, at a young age to divert us off of these spiritual courses or our, our true mission here and um basically we are these light bodies right we have this amazing body this material body and these layers above us these the our aura our astral our our soul our spirit the souls keeping them all enclosed and I feel that we're, we're these light bodies, but we're chose to come to this material realm to experience these five senses, to experience this material world, you know, to almost go through like a school learning lessons. But now this plane has been hijacked. You know, if you want to put it as an ultra intelligence or some kind of dark force, there has been a dark force that has taken over this plane. So all of our missions of coming here to experience this earth school has been hijacked and we're coming into this incarnation with amnesia. We have no clue what we are, where we came from, what we're doing here, why we feel this way. We're, we're just a vexed species. So my specific family line was about holding on to this information of who we are. And um, I don't want to come across, like I say, that I know have all the answers or that I know everything because I don't, you know, the, what I do know is the more that I, I take in and the more that I, um, more information that I obtain, the more I realize that I, I know less and less, you know, it's, 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 I catch a little glimpse here and there of what's really taking place and putting the pieces of, of the puzzle together through these ancient stories that have been passed down in my family and in other people's families. And, you know, when my body responds to certain information that I pull in and then I read and that um, when I connect certain dots, I know. And, I, you know, I feel that a lot of us are put in certain situations, in certain families, in certain um, dysfunctional 
situations to divert us off our true mission so we can come here and experience this physical plane and enjoy it and go through us a, a life lesson and school and all this and not sell out to the machine that's taking it over and for me and being in this family and me being the one that was chosen in my family line to receive this information and to come into this physical plane and help revive the knowledge that's hidden within all of us. And I feel that's my true mission is to be here to help people remember who they are. And my specific family, like I said, has been holding on to this information and holding on to certain abilities to help revive this knowledge. And when I was um, a child, I was born with um, a red mark outside of my right eye. It was a bright red mark, a birthmark. And in my family line, that was seen in, in the shamanic heritage and other shamanistic practices. When you have a right, bright red birthmark like that, it's seen as a mark of some kind of mark of divinity or mark of a, um, a higher, um, a sixth sensor in a way or, or, or outside ability. And when it's near your eye area like that, it's a mark of second sight. Um, Genghis Khan had one of these marks. He had it in his left palm. And they saw that as being a mark that he was going to be a great killer and warrior and, and a, a, you know, be a, a, a shamanistic warrior, a king and a shaman. You know? And um, my parents had that birthmark removed when I was about one or two years old. It's in my early baby pictures. And that, I feel, was was a, a mark of saying that I was born with the second sight. And from the time I was born um, up until I was in kindergarten, um, I had um, many different experiences. One of them being when I was like around in kindergarten, when I first started going to school, I had these imaginary friends and they would be um, like these shadow beings, these shadow blobs, just the black little silhouettes that wouldn't scare me, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't frighten me at all. And actually I would be playing like my GI Joes with them and, and, and doing things like that with them. And I feel this is part of this dark force, this that's involved with not only the Vatican and, and organized religion, but some kind of ultra intelligence that has access to our holographic library and universe. And, you know, has access to everything that's ever been said, done, or thought on this physical plane or in all the other planes of existence. And it's sort of like when I mentioned on our, our earlier show how um, we all live in this macro spiral, right? We live in this spiral of life. And then everything that exists in this spiral of life has this material form, you know, has uh, this essence. And anything outside of this spiral that exists outside of our, our macro spiral that rises right up besides the Pleiades, anything without an essence is outside of this spiral. So I feel from my experiences and from my life that this ultra intelligence, this, this dark machine has been trying to interweave with our spiral of life and merge all of these spiritual timelines into one singular one, one timeline that's suitable for it to thrive, for it to experience spiritual bliss, not for our physical body to experience physical uh, bliss, but for it to experience bliss. And it has all these years to terraform this planet to get it ready. And I feel this time on our planet now is one of the most crucial times that we have ever experienced and that we've all agreed to come here, to be here, to help take this back and, and, and fight this. And I, I feel it was part of the downfall of Atlantis was they were more of a spiritual based society more than we are. And then with this thing tried to interweave with their spiral of life back then, it was, uh, it, it couldn't take it on. It wasn't ready. And now they've tried to terraform it. So I caught glimpses of this, even as a child, this ultra intelligence that can manifest itself and replicate itself in all types of ways. And like I said, it can tap into the holographic universe and make certain images I feel appear and simulated experiences 
And not only that, but I feel they can also manipulate atoms and molecules and matter and be able to push things into matter on our physical plane for short periods of time or forever how long for it to affect, you know, what's going on on our physical plane and actually be able to see it in this physical realm. So these children that I would play with were black shadows and they were my, you know, imaginary friends for a little while. No one else saw them. And they would literally, Randy, Emily, they would literally be uh, coming from the electricity, coming from the electrical currents. Because I would be downstairs watching TV or playing Nintendo or some whatever was out at that time. It was probably in about 1984, 83, somewhere around there. I was five or six. I was born in 78. So whatever year that was, I was in kindergarten. And I would feel a hum um, coming in my ears. Uh, an energetic hum and it felt like it was coming from the walls and the electricity and within a second or two or two those three children or shadow kids or whatever you want to call them would be beside me always to the corner of my eye never head on they would be always to the corner and I was interacting with them they were charming I would be laughing you know I can't tell you exact words because it was so long ago but I was having full-on playing games with them and playing with my GI Joes. And, you know, they were working on a relationship with me for, for probably a few months. And the thing is that, and stop me if I'm talking too much, but the, 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 the thing is that the, when they would come and I would feel that humming in my ears and, and experience that the day after I would go to school the next morning and experience ear infections and ear aches. And I would go to the nurse. They would have to send me home. I would go to the doctor. I would have an ear infection when I would go home and they tried to give me penicillin, I was allergic to that. They had nothing would work. And when I went home, the earache would go away when those children would appear or those shadow, whatever you want to call them would appear. And, um, it started getting so frequent that I would be going to the nurse at school and I was having all these ear infections that the doctor was threatening me that we're going to put tubes in my ears. So I stopped telling my mom about the earaches because I was just dealing with it until till I would get home and I would rush home. I would go to the nurse cause I didn't feel good. I would rush home to try to have these kids come. So my ears would feel better. And finally one day, I guess they, they figured they had my trust. I believed in them or whatever. Um, they appeared and they told me, Oh, we can play like this forever. Just come here. So I followed them behind the TV and this was the only time I ever saw them head on and they were like black silhouettes, almost like TV static, but black and almost blinking or, or pulsating in a way. And the, t the TV wires were picked up from behind the TV and they handed them over to me and said, you could be with us forever. Just bite these. You could play with us forever. And like the way it was said and you know, my instincts kicked in, I ran to my mother, you know, horrified. And she was screaming, and that was the last time I, I saw of them. And that was probably one of my last psychic experiences, actually, for a, a number of years until probably 1987. So that, I think, was one of the first glimpses that I can remember of this dark force um, chasing me down. Wow. So, okay, a couple of things come to mind as I'm listening to you talk. Um, okay, so – this is taking me back to a conversation I had with one of our listeners, Jim, um, and something he and I have both experienced. Have you ever heard of lily waves? Lily waves. Yeah. They're like a certain kind of like wave or electric. They're waves that ride actually ride on the um, same electromagnetic spectrum as uh, AC current, house current. Yeah. Okay. They're, so okay. They were invented by John Lilly, who was a, a, a pretty high end government scientist. Yeah, he, Lily is also uh, one who uh, experimented with um, the, like uh, the sensory deprivation tanks, the floating tanks that are now very popular and whatever. Um, yeah, he, yeah. His technologies have been used a lot in mind control in different kinds of applications. Um, but one of the things that Jim and I would talk about is we've both experienced this thing where basically we call it the black particle nanotech. Yeah. And it's basically, um, so this used to happen to me, I'd be laying in my bed and I'd be like get, getting ready to go to sleep. And I would literally like everything else now should be still. And I would start to watch these like black particle, like black look sort of like, that's the best way I can describe, describe it. Like 
um, black particles or like, you know, when you were little and you played like magna doodle or yeah. um, etch a sketch and you would like mag you move those little black magnet particles around. Yep. It looked kind of like that. It would be coming off the walls and moving towards me. And it was like, it was like alive, like it, it had entity or energy behind it. Yeah. And so and I've also seen these in the outside in the sky, like sometimes on days when there's like a lot of, um, not so much when there's a lot of like typical chemtrails, but when there's a lot of like cloaked cloud craft or a lot of like those sort of like what you call dragon clouds kinds of things, yeah. or when you see like the big faces or figures in the clouds, I will notice like sometimes I'd be driving down the road and there'd be like this swarm of what looks like black, like coal ash or black dust or black particle nanotech. And what I've always thought about, about it in relation to that is it somehow, it's some kind of particle or tech or something that has maybe something to do with some of the spraying or some of these kinds of lily waves that allow entities or energies, extra dimensional energies or entities to attach themselves to it, almost like to magnetize to it, allows them to come into form, even though it's not really a solid form, come into form. And yes, they are, it is more one of those kind of out of the corner of your eyes kind of things, because whenever you try and look at it head on, it seems to sort of pull back or disappear. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, yeah I, I, you know, like I, I've only really ever experienced it at the house, the one house that I spent most of my life living in. I experienced it once one other place. Um, you know, so I think sometimes these houses that we grow up in, it's not a mistake that we're born into the family we're born into and that we're growing up where we're growing up. And some of this stuff is targeted um, both from a, a here on earth people kind of thing, but also the energies and entities behind them. And I think there's almost like a magnetization that occurs between some of this sort of hard application mind control technology and, and practices done here, but also these extra dimensional, you know, forces or energies that are really what is powering that. Um, and what you're describing sounds like, I mean, it almost sounds like usually this doesn't occur until much later for someone who's like you or like, you know, one of us. Um, that, that that was an early attempt at termination programming, trying to yeah. get you to bite the wire. And it's and it's like it, it's all some sort of, if you want to call it technology or magic that has, you know, infested our whole our, our whole reality. Because like if you think about it for for a, a, a massive spell or any type of spell to work, right, you have to have forces that work together right so yeah. if, if forces are working together there there there's got to be a certain amount of things that happen there has to be a magical current and there has to be like an astral substance and there has to be like a trained mind so if we're having our timelines being manipulated and there's a bleed through with all the other realms mm -hmm. you know and our minds are, are trained in certain visualization visualizations and in concentrations and imaginations and then we're raising our personal power through all of these visualizations and all of these little synchronicities and our spiritual awakenings that we're having. And this magical current is coming into the elemental plane from, you know, and it's a current that's flowing to and from the astral plane and it's bleeding through. And maybe we're seeing little bits of this energy in, in our dimension and it's sort of like opening yeah. up portals, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. And it's um, replicating and it's, it's interweaved with some kind of ultra I intelligence, you know, and some kind of uh, like, you know, these, whatever these D-wave technologies and, and these yeah. technologies that can blend realities. Yep. You know, and, and if they're using what we call witchcraft or, or magic and they're weaponizing it with electronics, mm -hmm. you know, all of this happening is, is making our atmosphere literally in enchantment. We're walking around in a, in a in a dark enchantment yeah that's well you know if you see if you stop to think about it for a minute most of the paranormal events that are documented in some way or another play into the electromagnetic field uh, especially ufology i've noticed this even from my own experiences that there was a high incidence of ufo activity around high tension cables uh electrical yeah. electrical towers Mm -hmm. anything where you had uh, a very dense electrical field and it's no different with the paranormal I and mean, we look at it there are natural rifts in the electromagnetic spectrum that occur in nature itself yeah. so and, and a lot the thing of times is too, they were they not to cut you off but the thing is too they were trying to get me to to bite the wires so either when well, no, I was going to bite the wires I was either going to die and they were somehow was going to go with me but I think it, it might even go um, 
beyond that in a way because magnify your energy and they were going to feast on it or something yeah, like that yeah yeah and you know like because it's like anything that that enters the flow of energy will will actually manifest in the realm opposite its origin so if i entered that current and i bit into that current and entered the flow of that energy then something opposite this realm will manifest because of it and the, this astral substance right it forms around any energy that enters it or or you know stimulates it and, and and hits it so some some sort of transformation would take place in other realms i don't know if it would transport my spirit or transport my light body or transport some kind of energy but once i entered that flow of energy that current it would affect the other planes of existence for sure well as well you have the fact that that's actually one of the ways in which they create orders in um, mm -hmm. programming. Yeah. Is use of electri uh, electrocution. So, Split, I mean, yeah. a, lot, a lot of times I think of the splitting of the mind can be like, you know, there could almost be a compartment that is like uh, aligned with each one of the five energetic bodies that we talk about, right? Yeah. So it could have been, I mean, in some ways, like, you know, sometimes how we remember things when we're little, um, I mean, I have a feeling you're like me and you have a really good memory, but sometimes like how we remember things I mean, is a little bit different than how it actually happened. And maybe what you were experiencing is exactly sort of what Randy is talking about. You're experiencing um, uh, an, electrician, an electrician, electrocution kind of experience meant to fragment both your mind and your energetic body. Isn't this quite possible? Yeah. And, and, and who knows what could have happened, you know, and where – if it if it is fragmented, where those fragments get scattered to? Well, you know, here again, it's a cautionary tale. Kids, don't be biting wires. It's been, take that from somebody that has bit wires. Oh, that's uh, how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I I was sitting here and I was thinking about this, and you're talking about these these spectral beings, and I, I flash back again to Trevor James Constable and the work that he did, which again kind of tapped into. It intersected the a couple of different realms, but he was getting these sylphs that he was photographing and these strange apparitions in the sky, all of which appear to have some connection to the electromagnetic spectrum as well. So when we're talking about this, we're, and, and I'll tell you where this is going for me. So the, let me let me be let me have the privilege of steering the first tangent here because I want to just run this by. So we're building 5G. We've got all these smart devices. And this, is my, this is my term now that I just cringe at. Everything's a smart device. So we have all these smart <laughs> devices. We're, 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 they're rolling out 5G actually literally four years early. Now, when has technology ever rolled out early? When? Except that they're pushing the envelope now. So... I'm looking at this, I'm looking at the smart meters, all of the smart devices, the incredible radiation, non-ionizing radiation that's coming off of all these devices, and then this gigantic electromagnetic web that they're building around us. And I'm thinking, okay, so it's almost like they're, they're, they're getting the house ready for some guests. So here's, a, here's an idea. What if, just what if, this is all some kind of build out to bring the archons in? That, well, that, that's interesting that you say that because when I... Of course it is. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right? That, when I was describing the things coming off the wall, I always... Yeah. Feel the feeling of that is our contact. I always feel like the archons are like some kind of like digital spider, like some sort of like, you know, people describe them as like these large spider kinds of beings, but there's a very digital feel to it. It's a technological spider. It isn't like, you know, the one- Spiders that you, are digital though. They, they really are. are. They're well, just- they, Well, they disappear. You look at it once and it's there and you look again and it's yeah. gone. So it, flashes it flashes in, it flashes, in, it flashes out. out. So yeah, no, to me, whatever this technology is or mag whatever sort of blend of like magic and technology, it is of, it is of the archons. It is archontic for sure. Yeah. Well, there, and, and now that we're going down that tangent, let's go down, <laughs> you know, so there, I, I feel there's different kinds of, of what we call archons. And one of them um, 
can they can manifest in different ways. One can manifest itself to like a reptoid type huge entity, right? And mm-hmm. another can also be like an amoeba type mm-hmm. worm type, mm-hmm. um, some kind of like infection that can I feel that is coming sort of from the ancestral realm into our mortal one. Is and, this the one thing you were talking about in your video the other day about like on your spine? I, lo- yeah. I was listening. You know, I just want to tell you, I love listening to your little videos. And I was telling you <laughs> the other day, I want to answer back to them though. Like sometimes I wish I could like call you on the phone yeah. and, and tell you what it's making me think of when I'm listening to you talk. That would be funny if we could make a video where we were like talking back and forth to each other because it brings up uh, so many things. Like I always figure maybe I should make a, a, a response video or whatever because it always brings up a lot of interesting uh, things for me. Um, yes, yeah, so I, 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 I agree. With, when you say the more reptoid type being, to me it feels a little bit more mantid than reptoid. Well, it could be. See, what, what I feel it is, is, is that it, it attaches itself when it finally gets through our energetic bodies and gets mm-hmm. to our physical body. And then it, it attaches itself to our spine and goes up the spinal cord and hits the back of our brainstem. And that, that, mm-hmm. that reptilian part of us, that, that part yes. that deals with our impulses, it can manifest these beings and these yes. beings can appear. And that's what I think is it hits that, that part of our brain that reptilian part of us and whether it's mantid or some sort of it's it's i feel this is part of a technology and it is replicating rep, reptoids and insectoids because they are the yeah. most dominant species yeah. yep. and they are the most cold and robotic like and i totally think that, that we're like whatever this is whatever technology or things this is we are con- they're constantly trying to um inject us infest us with parasitic kinds of beings that like 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 a worm or a parasite parasites look sort of like worms i think parasite is closer maybe than just like worm like you know parasite a pinworm a hookworm a tapeworm or something but i do agree i think the spinal cord is an area you know that's they always wanted to do you know like you get sick when you're a kid they always want to do a spinal tap and shit like that i don't know if that's something that they want to try and inject or if they want to check and see if it's there or what the hell's going on but that's the i mean I definitely think that that's that whole weird thing that they did in fringe. Remember that? When, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, we're not talking about anything that hasn't at least been touched on before here. I mean, there's just, there's something else going on here. Yeah. Well, one of the technology too, that, that I feel that's involved with this, this arc, if you want to call it an archon or a spirit rider or whatever you want to call it, it does something we, we call fetching so certain yeah. um, shamanistic practices call it fetching where it will actually take your consciousness to another plane or realm. It'll, mm-hmm. it'll give it memories that, that weren't really yours. It's from your ancestor or from your genetics and it will replay these memories in your head. It'll make you um, in life have, if you, if you never had any kind of alignment practice or energy work, you'll, you'll feel like you're going psychotic and you're having a mental a breakdown so it, it most people it goes unnoticed and they don't realize what what's actually taking place but if we try to look at this like it's almost like a virus for your psyche and it's a connection to your ancestors you can try to heal it and send it wisdom and send it appreciate the words you're speaking to it and try to heal it because i think if we try to rip them out of us it's not doing anything any good if someone's trying to remove your chakras or manipulate something or rip something out of you you should run and run fast but if you try to heal yourself and try to work with it and send it wisdom mm-hmm. then you can look at it like a, like it's a a connection to your ancestors or or something like that instead of looking at it like you're some kind of programmed monster well that's what I I, mean, I always I, I know exactly what you're talking about the kind of experience that you're talking about and I agree with you this the whole like idea of removing your chakras or ripping things out I think of it more as deprogramming the chakra and that doesn't mean forgetting the experience it means you know like that what you were talking about like that connection with the the um the ancestral memories or your ancestral beings or whatever like in, you know it's different to um have that wisdom than it is to be programmed by that experience. And so the deprogramming, uh, you know, a lot of the programming lays down in the chakra points and, you know, and along the spinal cord and things like that. And if you can sort of deprogram that, that doesn't mean you don't take that information. It just means that information is for you to sort of understand and use in a way that is beneficial as opposed to being run by it. I mean, I mean, and, and I, I agree totally. And, and 
I, it's not something that we're just making up. I mean, they've been talking about this in different ways for thousands of years. The Mayans called it a vision serpent. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. even in if you go if you go back to Perseus, he had encounters with those three witches that would show that one eye, and uh -huh. the eye would be passed around between them so they can see through the you know this one eye saw it all saw the past the present the future everything through this one eye and i feel that that's that's why they picture this this serpent crawling up your spine with the eye in its mouth it's some sort of um eye of the past it's 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 some kind of and i and i feel it also it will choose somebody in this incarnation or in the current lineage that is spiritually powerful enough to deal with it and, and it'll single them out you know, and, and that's why most people, they don't realize what's happening to them, but they don't, and they think that they're weak or they're crazy, but actually it's because you're strong and powerful that it's even in, in you and, and, and messing with you. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think all of these kinds of experiences happen for that reason. Um, takes me back for a second to something I wanted to say in regards to what you said when we first came on about us coming in here and, you know, making an agreement to come in here during this time. I've always kind of felt like, um, and I've sort of evolved sort of how I speak about it a, a little bit since I started thinking this way, but I think like our highest self, you know, our highest, our knowing self as Cliff, Cliff, our friend Cliff might call it or whatever, exists outside of time. And yeah. somehow we came into the, this, you know, realm to experience the things that you spoke of, but something happened and we got stuck in a way that we, we, we do, that wasn't, we weren't supposed to, or that wasn't the intention or wasn't part of the original agreement. And our knowing mind is still out there. And the, you know, the rest of us is kind of in here going through these different incarnations. And some of us figured out that, oh, there's a problem going on and what's happening there isn't right. And we agreed, and I, I, you know, we've had this conversation with many people that we've interviewed on the show. And it does feel like we're trying to like reassemble the team of people that agreed to come here. But I think sort of what happened, so much of maybe what we were witnessing from above or outside of time has to do with a level of mind control that the uh, human species has been put under. And so, you know, because when you choose to come in here, you come in, you get amnesia when you come in, somehow what we did was intentionally agree to come into a family, a body that would go through the mind control experience because we understood that was the problem here and that would be the fastest thing to wake us up. So that's why so many of us who are doing this work have also been people who've been through projects and programs or whatever is because we understood that that was sort of the fastest way to sort of wake ourselves up and start remembering what we're here because we're supposed to do. You know what I mean? Like I, I know lots of other people that are wonderful people, but they, they're not, you know, that um, they're just kind of, in, some of them are great people and do important things, but they're here enjoying their life and they're not, they don't feel directed on the same kind of mission that a lot of us feel like we're here for. And I think that sort of the, um, a lot of these things that we figured out, we wouldn't have figured out if we hadn't been through all of these unpleasant and controlling kinds of experiences that we talk about. So, so this is what you're describing. This, this is not my terminology. Um, we are basically the white blood cells in the body of this whole collective. Because basically we're the ones that are fighting it. We are the ones that have, even just energetically, people say, well, I don't see you out there battling. Well, actually, I've done a lot of battling, and I still continue to do a lot of battling. People don't understand the energetic level of warfare. Yeah, I think there's several hundred thousand of us right now. I, I, I would say there's about 144,000. 144,000. We're reassembling well, that, the body yeah, here, Ross. Ask Lana Leone about that. I, I think she would agree with that. So, I, well, that's kind of the way I see it is that we're the white blood cells in a, in a bigger, in a, in a body that is basically stumbling around, which is humanity. And humanity doesn't know why it's here. It doesn't know how it got here. It doesn't know where it's going. And it wants to enjoy the temporal aspects of life right now. That's, that's a composite picture of the average human being, mm -hmm. regardless of who they are, where they are. On the edges of all this are the people who frame out the reality that, oh, yes, there's a bigger picture. There is a grand scheme to all this. There's a there's a time frame to it. Oh, God, now we've got to go into time. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> you love it, Randy. But, but, yeah. but you've got to muck around in time because yeah. you're right. The oversoul, the oversoul is out of time. Mm -hmm. In fact, I argue that we generate time. That yes. 
For sure. As humans, we generate the time codes that are the pulses. It's not the minutes, hours, seconds, milliseconds, nanoseconds, whatever. Time isn't real from that standpoint. What's real is that we generate a time field, a time domain, like we've talked about with Cliff. So it's outside of that and it's over seeing. It is the watcher. It is the thing that guides us. And the thing that wakes us up and makes the connection in a lot of cases, quite frankly, is trauma. Yeah. There's just no way around it. Everybody I talk to that's even remotely awake has a trauma experience. It's either a car accident, a head injury, they almost drowned, they went through a project, they were in some kind of mind control system, they were horribly beaten, raped, stabbed, SRA, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the whole thing. Yeah. No, I mean, hey, bro, just out of curiosity, have you, ever, have you had a spinal cord or head or neck injury? Um, yeah, I had some ser- serious head injuries before. Yeah, so it's interesting. Like almost everybody that we talk to, yeah. that, that, that is kind of what we would consider to be sort of part of one of us kind of thing. We've all had traumatic head, neck, or spinal cord injuries. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like I, I don't know if that is part of the awakening process or part of the trauma, pro- part of the intentional trauma process, but it does seem that like the, for most of us, that was really when like the, a split occurred and we started to recognize that, wait a second, there's something going on here and it wasn't, it's not what we were told. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. No, I had, um, I had two, two really bad near death experiences within, within two years time. And, um, one was from a head injury and, um, like I got shut off for a, a long period of time. And, what I remembered, you know, when I came back was, you know, pretty frightening actually. And it's been replayed in my head from times and time. And, and I think that was part of my download or whatever, whatever you want to call it started to interface with my consciousness at that point. And, um, and that's significant about the year. Like I said before, with, with 1987, there's some kind of um, energy that was on our planet or coming some kind of frequency or dimensional shift that I I think started in 1987 that finished in 2012. And this shift. I could buy that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I mean, now I had not thought about 1987 before, but now that you mention it, there was sort of like some kind of, I guess the best way I could describe it is a dark wave. Like a like a dark, you know what I mean? Like some kind of dark dark wave of energy, that I, yeah, and that and I agree that it. Yeah. This, it, it was it was taking place in media too. I mean, the 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 rappers were having wars. All these. Yeah, wars. exactly. We were just talking about this, and you go back 1977. You have basically the which was when I was conceived. Right, and and see, that was the the the, the famous New York City blackout. The summer mm-hmm. that, that they burned the Bronx, the South Bronx, that was yeah. the summer that Grandmaster Flash was breaking out. Wow. And that was the beginning of the hip-hop culture, then flash forward 10 years. Now, isn't it interesting? We're in an 80s revival right now. Stranger Things is getting ready to start up again this Thursday night, well, Halloween, Halloween time. Of course. Of course. And, and that's completely retro 80s, but it's like... Emily just went to a Depeche, Depeche Mode, Mode concert. I, 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 oh, I love Depeche Mode. Mode. I grew up with that. We all man. love yeah, Depeche Mode. Girls, dude, but, think, less than that. but think about that. That was Depeche, all cool. Depeche Mode was considered new wave music, and they really had their first big hit album about 1987. Yeah. And, you know, I just saw them the other night. They were phenomenal. But it is, it really took me back to that time period of my life. And I actually... Um, so we're looking at like a 25-year chunk, Ra, 1977 yeah. to 2012. I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and say I, I'm. Uh, is that 35 years? No, 12, 25 no, years. 25, 25 yeah. years. That, like, yeah, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna go ahead and agree with you and say that that's an interesting. So that's like a quarter of a century, and wow, like I actually. <laughs> I, I don't even know what to say about it. But it like, puts a really- perspective on it a quarter century right there. I mean, yeah, there's something going on. But actually, you know, you had, what was it, 1989 would have been the, the harmonic convergence that, it, that, that was celebrated by the New Age at that time. 
Right. And that was actually the wind up for this whole thing that kind of built into the 2012 scenario. Yep. The whole new age. That was, yeah. And the music, is, it's funny that we mentioned the music because the music is all music. part of this. Of it's course music. it is. And it's 80s hard. music, you know, I'm listening to some bands right now that I swear to God, I've checked the recordings just to make sure this was in an <laughs> 80s band because they're using retro synths and they're using yeah. the drum machines, the 808s and all this yeah. stuff that was, that was all part of that, that era of music. And, uh, it, it, it and, and this music and, and media and everything, it's being affected by what I call time jumpers and, and all of this. And as long even our scriptures and ancient documents, everything is being affected by what's happening, this bleed through that's happening. Yeah. And what, what my family lineage, and we could get into more like of my lineage later if you want, and, and the Lake Nemi that my family comes from and the significance of it now and the portal that lies beneath and why the Vatican is connected to Lake Nemi. It's well, nice. you've already started down the rabbit hole. Let's do it. Unwrap it, my brother. I've, I've heard you talk about this a little before, and I, I like this. This is pretty this interesting line. stuff. Let's go down yeah. this rabbit hole, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and just, to, just to sum up, too, like, real quick about the Vatican, right? Because, um, you know, just to go down the rabbit hole. Of, You're just jealous that you don't have pointy, sparkly shoes like they do. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and a pointy hat. Come How on. do you know I don't? <laughs> Well, Randy, Randy has them, so. Yeah, as long as you don't have a fish mouth hat like they do. <laughs> right? They ever see their hats? It's like shaped yeah, like, it's, well, it's, like that's Dagon, portion. the fish god. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, that yeah. comes straight from. Yep, yep. That's straight yeah. from the Dogon. Yep. And and it's it's uh, amphibious, you know, some kind of fish mouth top, and you know the Vatican, even uh, in Etruscan lore uh, my family's all e comes from etruscan and um it's said in my family that we got it actually from the persians and the persians got it from a mysterious star people so from mm -hmm. from ancient persia it was passed down to the etruscans and that's where my family got this so the Vatic vatican actually is named after the goddess of the death vatica to the etruscans is the Vat is the goddess of the death and in slavic they called her like a basically like a they would they would call her something else like a bone goddess or, or some kind of a thing like this but um this this bone mother or a goddess of the death she would be the one that destroys and resurrects and even as the earth from which we have our being is born it's resurrected each year from this this earth goddess or this death goddess and she collects our whitened bones and she pours the water of life and death upon them and sings her magic songs and keeps us in her enchantment. So to, for the Vatican to name her, their whole society after something, uh, a goddess that is the goddess of death that keeps her us under her enchantment with her song. And, and she, you know, has all different types of lore that's associated with her. Also, you know, the Etruscans, they started burying their dead. Um, where they got that from was from, they would bury their dead on a hill, actually. So when you, they can look down over the portal that your soul would enter in the underworld before it goes towards the lunar realm. So they were burying their dead on a hill so it can look down and be closer to inner earth to see it go to the inner earth realm before it goes to the lunar realm. And that's where they believe that the goddess Diana would hunt with her dogs in the shadows of the moon. And in the plains, it would be the, the, the parts of the white spots. And that whole moon is connected to basically it's like some sort of astral base that our whole that is controlling the whole time of our planet. And I feel that when time was brought here, you know, that's when the moon was brought here. That's when time started on this physical plane. And that whole moon and sun runs our whole freaking earth and it's a technology that is um you know drawing energies in and the sun is amplifying them you know and the electromagnetic field of the earth it, it collects and draws these energies in the the moon is drawing them and in and the, the sun is amplifying them and the sun is affecting everything within us do you think these technologies that are the moon and the sun are sort of um sent by or like that they're of saturn right because saturn was considered, is considered our sun i right. think it was our sun at one time yeah yeah and so like I, I i you know we always talk people talk about the saturn moon matrix and stuff like that like i've always felt like the the moon is some sort of like a 
like sat like radar or some sort of like midpoint or some sort of like the thing that like uh, all of the uh, time instructions or all of like the time control comes from like sort of the black cube that is Saturn to the black cube that is you know on the far yeah. side. Of the moon. I, I don't think these planets exist like like we do like we think. No, that. no, uh, absolutely you know, not. Thank I you. I think the stars are kind of keeping us in as a grid, like oh, well, keeping us in. Like there's some yeah. kind of grid work that's keeping us trapped in this dome. Yeah. You know? I really do think that that's what it is. And, and even the legends of, as the stars being like the constellations are being giants in the sky or these old entities. I, I, and the stars were seen to the ancient per Persians as the watchers, the eyes of the night from yeah. their watchtowers yes, looking exactly. down, controlling us, you know, and, and that's what I feel that they are. They're, they're keeping us in this grid somehow, it's keeping us in this, this, dome like like we're quarantined in this dome and the stars are keeping us in i think They're, that's what's keeping us in the grid yeah no i mean it, that's yeah. well this is this whole uber fascination that's gone on with space over the course of my entire lifetime and even preceding that really goes back to the mid 1800s and certainly by the end of the 1900s they started to plant the seeds of this, this, this man going to the stars thing. And it's always felt to me kind of fake and phony. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, like the whole moon landing thing. And then there's like, mm -hmm. you know, we come to find out that, gosh, they probably filmed that in a studio and the Cuban. Yeah, we're not going to space. We, we're going to we're other going realms. To space. There is yeah. space is something else. Yes. And this is Emily and I have been talking about this for years about the fact that we both had the sense that space as it would properly be understood, meaning deep space, not the circumferential vertical space that seems to surround the earth is something accessed through the deep, the oceans specifically, oceanic portals, or the depths of the earth at certain key spots where you have access to the inner worlds. Because I also believe that the earth is composed of, of several worlds within its domain as well. Yep. 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 Worlds within worlds. And see these, and these constructs, these constructs are all flattened by this whole space thing. So you've got, you know, you've got, Billions of trillions of dollars being dumped into programs that clearly aren't taking us to space. We don't know what the hell they're doing with it. Well, it's, yeah, it's just the complete, like, just like it's a fantasy. It's the complete inversion of reality. The truth is, is the universe is inside you. The truth is, the deep, the deepest depths of space are so are, are, are inside of you, and it's only the journey inward that is going to you know lead to exploring what is out there and by what is out there i don't mean what is up and out i mean what are all the possibilities for you know for, for you um well uh, even the physical domain itself because it's not what we think it is and because we aren't what we think we are nope we don't understand we actually have the ability to unlock this stuff and i gotta tell you i'm doing research right now it's blowing my freaking mind can you about, share some I, well, I just, okay, so I started out challenging the planetary galactic construct, okay. largely spinning off of, okay, so for about five minutes, I was amused by the flat earth people because they ask valid questions. Now, they've gone off and they've formed cults endlessly and they're, <laughs> they're, 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 they're sorry, yeah. if you're it's a just flat earther, argument. you're you stuck. It's not going to get you anywhere. But it did pose some challenging questions. Yeah. And out of the challenging questions became nudges to understand some things that sat in the back of my head for a long time, including challenging this whole concept to space. And so I deconstructed in my head and remote viewed and kind of got this picture that I'm satisfied with about our galactic construct, which is all inside of the dome as opposed to you know billions upon billions the old carl sagan star trek you know blah 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 but the most interesting part is memories of underground specifically places like like bases and things like that and where 
is they are able to tap into something. Why are they underground bases? Why do they need to have underground bases? And you go, well, they're because they're secure, because they can do things down there. No, that's may, where access is. But it's also where things get interesting. Yeah. Because once you go to a certain depth inside the earth, and I'm talking 10 miles or more, things start to get different, including the fact that you can navigate distances very quickly due to the labyrinths that are, and tunnels that are there, some natural, some have been built, some are legacy from other civilizations, and the fact that time changes. Mm -hmm. Actually, time changes, there's an atmosphere, and there's actually light that's very different from our own solar light. So, and some of this is now being confirmed in a book that was kind of, somebody in Houston told me about this book, and I, I'm going to write an article on it, so I'm not going to tip it right now. But suffice to say that I now have almost completely reawakened some of my understanding about subterranean, this gets interesting, the mm -hmm. subterrane. Yeah. yeah. The subterrane. We have, we have a subterrane project coming up. Yeah, we have a subterrane project coming. And the subterrane and then the Galactos, which is basically, how to describe this? I don't have, I don't have words yet. It's, it's hyperdimensional. We are living in a hyperdimensional construct. Yeah. You could understand it as a, para, a parabolic structure or vortices. That's one way to understand it, but that's, that's really just one level of it because it's actually hyperdimensional in terms of how everything is laid out. So I don't, I, I don't follow anybody's um, designs on how this place is laid out. And, and some of it, quite frankly, I'm getting a lot of memories coming back that, that tell me that what goes on underground is very interesting. Yeah. I think there's whole, I mean, aside from just bases, I think there are whole other worlds down there. Worlds yes. within worlds, and the way that you access them is different than the way we travel, travel linearly from place to place. Well, yeah, I think you that... You have to line your frequency up with the frequency of that world to be able to enter it. Yeah, and I think it's, um, Inner Earth is, is not like an actual physical place. Like, we think it's actually um, time gates... Um, and access to other dimensions and other worlds, but it's surrounded by these time gates. And I feel that it's all different timelines that can access through these time gates. And they're, they're maybe even um, guarded by some sort of technology that you can't have access unless you're allowed it or welcomed into it. Or I think you have, you have to bring your body to vibrate at the proper frequency to be able to access those, yeah. those worlds. Yeah, that's what I think too. You have it's like kind of lining. You know, you go to this. You know, wherever the access point is, you kind of have to go there. And if you can bring your vibration into sync with that, then you, you can yeah, pass through. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. You'd have to have, have the exact sync, like coordinates almost. Like coordinates, but within your body, and and the frequency, like you know, requires the way you care for your body. You know, you know typically, but also just the way you're able to sort of. Um, you know, with the, uh, I'm losing my ability for words here, which happens to this sometimes, like the subtle energies of your body, you have to bring those under control. You have to control your breath and you have to bring like the subtle energy of your body right into the exact perfect resonance. And then it's almost like something opens up right, you know, when you, when you are able to hit that and it's the coordination of those different processes. And I think it's, um, I actually think that's what a lot of the training in projects and programs were for is they understood that, that certain people that came in with a certain frequency had a better chance of being able to line up and access with that. Well, they and, understood what, and what Rob was talking about earlier on, about even his engagement with the, with the, the, the shadow beings. That's all because the child is so attuned yet to that world. I mean, even at three and four and five years old, they're still closer to it than we are. I mean, once we start to talk, we begin to lose acuity in the spiritual realms. By the time we go to school, we have almost completely lost it. You hit puberty and you just punch the clock out. You aren't touching it or you get it reactivated. That's the interesting thing about that. You know, a lot of people get activated at puberty as well, especially females. 
it's kind of interesting. But the point is that the kids are so much closer to that. I mean, it, well, we talked about this on your show when I was on a few weeks ago. And yeah. thanks, by the way, it was a great yeah, show. Yeah, that was fun. It was, it was really good. I loved that show. I listened to it. I thought it was really, really good. Yeah, but I, I mentioned about my grandson, you know, experiencing the, the shadow beings. And it's real. I mean, I talked to him, you know, and, and, and it was real to him. And he was not fooling around. He had a healthy amount of fear, but he actually had kind of this interesting curiosity about it he wanted to know and he wanted it validated yeah i mean i think kids are, are nowadays they're coming in with a, a more of an awareness of things like that but at the same time they're also coming in with um they're learning no social skills um, <laughs> no, no they're 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 not they don't hang out like we hung out you know, it's uh, it's very hard to interact with each other in certain ways, and, and uh, I feel that a hundred percent of us are have some kind of programming for sure. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's only getting worse. And that this actually this this time now, these these experiencing these uh, this bleed through or whatever you want to call it with these what that's happening to our timelines. It's it's actually changing people little by little, and. It's a, it's a scary thing what's happening, but I think that we it's not like we're putting fear out there by talking about certain things like this. There's a way to break through this. There's a way to break through these barriers you know, and push beyond that. It's just that we have been brainwashed from the jump. I mean, as soon as we enter into this world where men and boys, they're, they're literally, um, you know, as soon as they enter the world, they're, they, they take a knife to their genitals. Yeah. yeah. You know, they're imprinted with fear and pain mm -hmm. the moment you step into this realm, you know. So uh, right off the jump, they have us. So we're, we're, we're programmed and, and programmed with fear. For, no. abso absolutely. The program with fear immediately comes in the programming from things like cartoons and those kinds of characters, the sugar, the juice, the sugar cereal, all these kinds of things. From the day we come in, it's stacked one on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other, and to the point you know, that, yeah, like it is, everybody is completely brainwashed. And, and I feel like um, what you're talking about with this bleed through of timelines and how it's affecting some people, I noticed that the way people are being affected by it, whether they be affected in a, I don't know if positive or negative is the right way, but you know, it, it seems to have to do with some of the ways that they, um, they take care of their, 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 their health and their body on a day-to-day -day basis. Like I'm watching certain people um, and how they're reacting to the strange energies of the, what we're going through right now. And I also am watching their behavior and it seems like people who care for their body in a particular kind of way are seem to be able to weather the storm in a way where they come through the experiences with something beneficial gained from it or some new awareness where the others seem to just fall deeper and deeper into um, uh, brainwashing or they you know, when you were talking about things manifest able to come into physical form, I can see like uh, entities and energies coming in, coming in and taking people over. Yeah. Uh, on the ever increasing pace with certain with, with some people. And well, that's the that's the thing with that too. It's like um, if you want to think out of it, like um, if somebody shoots um, has a bow and arrow and they shoot an arrow and it's an out of control arrow, arrow, but it's filled with a poison that pierces your generations and your her hereditary line, and it sticks and it feeds on its own likeness and it sticks to your consciousness and your and your psyche, and you're it's you're hosting it. You know, you're you're hosting mm -hmm. it. So the only way to and, 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 and exactly what it does to you, it does, it denies you the right to be an individual. It steals your sovereignty. You know, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, and it even do things like to you or someone, you know, will, will be claiming, oh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an MK Ultra or I'm a this or I'm a that. You're actually like clumping yourself into a category and yeah. taking away your individuality and you're actually being its host. So like if, 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 if someone has had these experiences and someone has had experiences where they think they've been mind controlled, the first thing you need to do is abruptly, immediately stop hosting it. Don't claim it and don't wear it as a badge of honor. You know, you got to drop that, break the programming immediately and yeah. stop claiming it as part of who you are, you know? And it, it's, like I said, it, it's, it's out there to make you emotionally crippled. Yeah. 
You know, it's like a, an alien barb for your soul. It's a soul feeding machine and it, and it affects you in all different ways. And it's a virus for your psyche. If you want to call it an archon, you want to call it artificial intelligence. It's something that feeds on its own likeness and it will invade your consciousness and it will pierce your generational line like an out of control poisonous arrow. It's interesting. You just brought this up, the generational line. Um, I've probably mentioned this before. Years ago, when I was doing my old radio show, which was called The Threshing Floor, that was actually a show about biblical prophecy. And I was studying Hebrew specifically in... Um, Kabbalah? No, actually, I was using the Hebrew just to study the standard Bible. And the book of Numbers, which is actually a book of numbers it's it's <laughs> the freaking generation yeah yeah and the word generations when i started to look at it and you go down through hebrew and there's so many different permutations of words and context and application yeah. at one point i had a line in front of me god i wish i still had these notes um i broke it down and discovered that that word generations flowed in time forward and backwards and it was like a breakthrough moment because i realized a lot of the bible is talking about redemption and it's like redemption of what and i realized that there's this whole thing that goes on there but it's everything so mass because the book's so diluted that it actually was a key part of the narrative that got lost in this concept of reclaiming your generations in the future in other words the redemption of generations succeeding you and this concept that we are inherently our own ancestors yeah yeah which is it's a pretty wild idea if you just that's, sit that's back a and great inheritance self self-generating self like we've generated given it kind of is yeah yeah, yeah. 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 cosmic currency yeah yeah, yeah. It is a cosmic currency, actually. There is nothing else of value. Yep. Millions of demons can't be wrong, baby. <laughs> yeah. For sure. I mean... And yeah, I do think there are demons. I know there are demons. I've been attacked by these bastards. I mean, I can tell you they're, they're nasty. Yeah, and, and, you know, to go back to um, that 1987 thing is that yep. during that time... Um, is when I first had a, uh, an encounter with what we call like a reptilian or a, a reptoid or whatever you want to call it. And it's funny because um, um, I heard that guy Jordan Maxwell talking one day um, years ago, and I don't listen to a lot of alternative media or anything, but I heard him talking not too long ago, maybe a year or two ago, and he was talking about um, – he was telling stories of um, – different people that he's talked to that had reptilian encounters and he talked about one that he that he heard that happened in 1987 where somebody saw um a group of reptilians in robes chanting in the desert and when i heard that um i was like wow that that probably is right on true because that's exactly what happened to me um in 1987 i was nine years old and um my family took me to disney to the Hilton hotel room. We got a nice hotel room at the Hilton in Orlando. And um, I never was boogie boarding in the ocean before. And I went boogie boarding and I got beat up by the waves and I was like super, super tired. And we were gonna go to dinner, but we went back to the hotel room first. And there's something about that Hilton hotel room that was just ominous too. And that whole Hilton hotel in Orlando was just a very ominous looking, um, I just got a, a, an ominous, feel to it as soon as i i got there actually that week orlando and, itself is first off what's underneath orlando is probably as interesting as what's above oh, ground in orlando um they, they built that that was actually a pretty secret building project up until disney formally announced what they were doing there but they had bought the land decades before and began quietly developing it. No, almost everybody understands it is its own government down there. Once you go into Orlando, and especially around Disney proper, you're basically in a separate world there. Yeah, you're right. 
You're definitely right. But that, that hotel room and that hotel was definitely an ominous feel. Like there was something strange taking place in that hotel at that time. And um, that day I was really beat up by the waves. I went back to the hotel room. Uh, my dad wasn't with us at that time. He was somewhere else. My mom went to go leave the hotel room for a second. I don't know if she went to get ice or whatever she went to go do. But I showered and then went to go lay down on bed. And I was so exa- exhausted. Um, I literally w- went to go lay down on the bed. And at that time, um, at, in Disney in 1987, there was this ride or this attraction called Figment. It was a purple dinosaur. And I had this Figment stuffed animal. I was holding it in my hands. It was a purple dinosaur, a yellow shirt. And um, I was squeezing this doll and I was, I went I to go. I remember these. The Figment, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And I still have magnets, like per, these magnets of this purple dinosaur. And so I was holding onto the stuffed animal and I went to go lay down the bed when my mom left the room. And I remember when I went to go lay down in the bed, I was so tired that I felt like I just sunk into the bed and I was feeling this vibration, this wah, and it was like coming to over me. And it was like, I felt like if I didn't shake my head, I was going to die. And um, I was so tired that I kind of just gave into it. And the next thing I know, it like it stopped and I was not like in the bed anymore. And I couldn't even see myself. Actually, I was floating towards the top of the ceiling and I saw the ceiling coming closer and but I couldn't see my actual body. And I looked down at the bed and I could see I was in the bed. And there was this glow about the room, almost that there was candles lit, but there was no candles. And um, I realized that flo- floating beside me was like a, a, a young girl, like a Native American girl, or whatever she was, but she was like in her natural, looked like a regular person. And she was floating there in the air next to me. And then I realized that we're, we're not in the room alone because I, I hear the chanting. I didn't hear it at first, but then it became, you know, present to me. And it was like, uh, uh, I heard the chanting before I saw anybody. And I, I heard that like, um, something like, hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, zip, 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 hey, uh, hey, almost like a backwards recording of Native American chanting. It was sort uh, of like an Enigma album. <laughs> yeah yeah they, yeah they're almost like that yeah yeah i, I like have to tell you i have to say listen, sitting here listening to you tell this story i can't even begin to explain to you like what is going on inside of my head <laughs> I, 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 i'm having like a physical physical visceral reaction we're, we're, he's describing something that we've we've had i mean yeah like I, it's, i'm having complete deja vu and but it's like i'm being attacked from like four different corners in my head with sound like i can't even it's very weird yeah, so like I was, I heard the chanting, and I, I, I don't remember like how I looked or what was going on with me because I couldn't actually see my body. But I saw standing around the bed was um, a number of robed monsters, and I thought they were figment. I thought they were figments. They, I thought they were pr- dragons, but they looked. They were robed. They were dark robed, and all I could see was their face. They're protruding out of their robe, the face, and it was like a komodo dragon. Like, yeah, vel- like like velvety kinds of robes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like velvety types of robes, yeah. dark purplish, like a purplish or purplish red, like a purplish yeah. red. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. And uh, it looked like a komodo dragon face, and I heard the chanting, and I was actually putting it my had arm like out. a little mohawk, like one has, right? Like a little, like the komodo dragon has, like that little spiked sort of mohawk. But I, they were hooded. They were hooded, but I saw the face yeah. poking out of the like the, the face poking out of the hood. And um, I was trying to reach over to the na- the Native American girl, like to try to touch her some way. And then I guess my mom was jiggling the door or putting something, to, opening the door, and everything just snapped back. And then I was clutching that stuffed animal in the room again, and everything was normal. And I was holding that stuffed animal. And I remember trying to tell my mom, like, "Oh my God, there was all these figment dinosaurs in the room. Like, holy shit, you know?" Like I was I was telling her, and she was like, "Wow, you know, you must have had some kind of dream." But the weird thing is. Um, That Native American girl, I don't know if it's some kind of attachment or some kind of artificial intelligence that's interfaced with me, but when I close my eyes, ever since that 1987, and that, and I have pictures from when I was in Disney from that year, everything, she's been with me ever since. Um, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but when I meditate sometimes, I can tap in and find her, 
and she'll take my hand and we'll go talk and she'll play charades with me. Like, it's like, I'm looking into her eyes and it's like a uh, knowing through certain symbols and through certain expressions and through certain looks in her eyes, I kind of figure out what she's trying to tell me, but it's not with actual wow. words. It's like charades. Wow. And the one day I saw her in Long Beach in the 30 years later, almost in 2002, when I was in Long Beach, I saw her in the park that I was in. It's like everything stopped for a moment. And I looked across the, the grass and I could see like energetic bodies around her. Like I could see layers of, of energy around her. And she looked up at me and she said, and I heard in my head, Beth, that, and you know, I took it as her name was Beth. And then I was researching it years later and I even saw like in Kabbalah and some of Alex Crowley's work, mm -hmm. Beth means the house of a spirit, the spirit house. Huh. So wow. All that's these... kind of weird. Yeah. Wow. The, it's making, I keep thinking about the, with this figment dragon dinosaur thing. Like, I, so I wonder like how many of these Disney figures that come and go over the years are intentionally like charged with that kind of like, you know, obviously most kids are buying them thinking that they're toys and whatever, yeah. but like the real purpose of them is that is as to, to be some sort of like, I, I, I always sure. felt that that doll that was pertinent to that experience for some reason. Totally. I, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I, I mean, like what we don't, you know, all these things that are coming through these factories and have Disney logos imprinted on them. What kind of, like, Sigils, you know, yeah. sigil, what kind of energy, like, are these like almost like totem animals or like uh, spirit animals, right? Yeah. yeah. Version of that. It's an yeah. inversion of a spirit animal. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, basically, so it's basically a dark entity. Yeah. Like what they're taking something that should be, you know, that ki the kids are like, Oh, I have my toy. I like this toy. And, and they truthfully, think, and what it really is, is what you're saying. And that's the whole basis of, of shape shifting too, is that you yeah. need to know the heart and soul of the creature. And, and then you, before you undertake it and become it, you know? So maybe what, if this thing is, is sort of becoming your, yeah, spirit. that's what, the, that's what, that's that's what Carlos Castaneda talked about in the teachings of Don Juan. He would teach the Yaqui would teach the the student in the desert with the peyote, and they would go into uh, the mind of a bird. Yeah, until they became the mind of the bird, until they were actually up flying and looking down from a bird's eye view. Yeah, and it was a literal transference of consciousness from the human into the animal at that yeah. point yeah i mean it's it's like um you know riding a, a medium you know it's a communion it's communion with that medium it's like almost like you know the power of the animal has to be understood it's not an outside thing it has to be understood within like the very nature of you needs to be like a frog if you have the frog like you know and your appearance has to be like a frog like you have to actually think like a frog or or a horse or a pig and you know when you you know have awareness and you think about your physical awareness it has to be like the physical awareness of that animal you have to think and feel like that animal to become that animal you know, and that's how shape shifting works. To to go into another realm and and to become another life form, it would you would have to actually think and feel like that animal. Well, yeah, that you, creature. Know you, you know, you sometimes see a person that reminds you of a, an animal, and it's usually because yeah. of the way they move or the way that you they feel like a dog or a horse. Or or from I've seen people that remind, yeah. I see a lot of people that remind me of or like, a pig. I've oh, seen a few of those. I've seen people that remind me of turtles, people that remind me of birds. Like I've seen a variety of different kinds of things, but there's something in general about sort of the way that they move, also the energy that they carry, but the way that they move. Um, when I was little, I remember like when, when, like just like learning in the young years in gymnastics and stuff with certain like skills that we were learning or certain tasks that we were doing, they would say, oh, pretend you're a monkey or pretend you're this, you know what I mean? To sort of master the movement of that kind of skill. So it's kind of interesting as well. Well, we see that etymology play out. I mean, it's, it's, it's in the human species itself. There are simply people, and I don't mean to be 
<laughs> mean spirit. How do, you, how do you even say this? Let's face it. There are humans that have an uncanny resemblance to certain creatures. <laughs> and sometimes yeah. you meet them and you discover that they actually have a lot of the same traits yeah. as yeah. creatures. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, a, it's almost like a cliche because comedy plays off of this, drama plays off. Actually, cartoons. Totally. You start to look at these. Heavens this, to Murgatroyd. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, Moose <laughs> and Squirrel. Mutant, teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Perfect. Yeah. 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 But you see, they're, they're portraying something there. It's an, it's an animism. It's, it's actually an animistic spirit. That they're, they're kind of giving you a sideways glimpse at the personification of the animals and then using that as a vehicle yeah. into this kind of animistic type. Uh, it's almost like a theology at some level. The big bad wolf, the three little mm. pigs, the all that. Yeah. 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 It was all played into the human drama as we interact with these things. And we think of them as lesser creatures. And in some cases, yeah, well, your sound just cut out, Randy. We can't hear you. I hear him. Yeah, in some cases, they actually aren't lower creatures. Some of them are animistic spirits that have in inhabited a form to communicate. Now, do you? I noticed on your web page, Raw, you write about owls, and I, I'd, I'd be interested to know what you think about owls. We had Mike Cleland on years ago, who's written a book on. Uh, his experiences in the paranormal, especially related the to owls, is the, the owls the of owls synchronicity. Of synchronicity. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, that's actually like a fam family symbol of mine is the owl. And I have the owl all tattooed on my back for my mom. And, and if you actually take the word strega, it comes from the, the root strix, which means screech owl in Latin. So the whole, the whole word strega actually comes from screech owl and you know, the owl is not some some look at it like a dark omen or or something like that but i think that's just a, a matter of like what they call a cult you know they think a cult means something dark when it's just hidden you know and it's been demonized over time but the owl um on on many levels is a shamanic animal that can um open portals as well just um i i think certain um animal thing things in the animal kingdom even um the croaking of frogs and things like that can open up gateways totally yeah them. totally you know and, yeah, and just think about the sounds of some of these creatures the sound of the screech of an owl is a very interesting sound well the screech of an owl also in ancient um tibet was known at times to be able to open the sutures on top of somebody's head you know um wow. the, and, and so the energies can come out like they would use ancient Tibetan monks would use um, manifestations and actually a astral tulpas, if you want to call them that, mm -hmm. to transform themselves into these massive owls. And, you know, to go, go off on a tangent is that I had this, um, I don't know if you want to call it a revelation or like a psychic prophetic dream. Um, have you ever heard of the Mothman? Everybody's heard of the Mothman, of course, right? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So I was, um, I wouldn't say obsessed, but I was really um, into that story for a while, years ago in the 90s. And something was like a remembrance of the past when I would hear the Mothman or I would research it or I would read the book from John Keel or – you know, my, my friend Tim Beckley was good friends with John Keel, and I've heard stories. And when I told him my experience, he was like, whoa, because it, like, had a lot of synchronicities to stuff that I didn't know that he knew. And um, so I, I actually, when I was talking about this, this Native American girl, actually, she, from what I've found out through the years, she's actually from a Hopi tribe. And um, I think she was abducted spiritually somehow, and maybe even her body was left in a catatonic state maybe or something because i've seen little glimpses so i've actually got this vision i think from from her or or something that was coming in the form of her gave me this vision and um i was asking in meditation and through dream time for me to get an answer about the mothman and what this thing was so i had this dream vision play out to me that felt so real and when I started to research 
um, more about the Mothman case when I got internet and stuff like that later on in life. I saw dots connecting that I never knew could possibly connect. So what I saw was maybe, I don't have no time reference, but it could have been hundreds of thousands of years ago. Um, there's this ancient mountain in sacred Tibet. I think it might, might be what's a, what we call Mount Kailash. Um, it, what I saw in the vision was uh, a mountain that almost was like a stupa kind of, almost like a pyramid type, but it had like an edges and was sharp. And it, it was an ancient mountain, but it was like a technology, this mountain. It was like a time machine or something, a manifesting time machine. And these ancient monks were like superhuman. They had like superhuman power and they can levitate and they were on top of this monk, uh, this mountain, and they would be up there for weeks on end meditating in a meditative state. And they were, would be able to manifest these, these astral topas in other realms. And somehow they would be able to appear in matter sometimes on this realm or, or some kind of blending of timelines or something would happen where it would appear in this realm. So this monk or whatever you want to call him, I saw him on top of this mountain hovering in the air in meditative state. And he was picturing some type of owl creature in his mind. And as these golden spirals circled his eyes i saw like golden spirals in his eyes circling there was also if you would like cut off the top of the mountain there was golden spirals lined inside the mountain spinning inside the mountain turning like golden at the same time as his eyes being golden and then all of a sudden this owl creature appeared at the top of this mountain but this owl creature is a manifest machine a karma machine whatever is happening Whatever the, the majority of the people spiritually are in the area that this thing is, it will gravitate towards that. If there's a lot of spiritual positive people around, it will bring and manifest goodness around. But if there's darkness around, this creature will manifest darkness around it. So I th over time, this creature was worshipped um, by these ancient Tibetans, I think, and that society started to change and more darkness was on the planet and they had to lock it down in some astral sort of cubed prison and it remained locked down there for thousands of years in some astral prison until around the 1950s or whatever that was when the Chinese invaded Tibet and burned down monks and I saw monks burning and this thing being released and that was around the 1950s. I think that when it was released, somehow by the 1960s, it made its way to Point Pleasant. Mm. And um, it was actually um, drawn to certain things, certain energies. And there was a, a bounty hunters looking for this thing, trying to bring it back to its prison. And did you ever hear of the, the Woody Derenberger sighting? Yeah, absolutely. I did okay, shows. Well he, I did your shows on this years ago. I remember yeah, your shows. Well, well on, he was on the road, yeah. right? He was on the road. Something, uh, some sort right. of like mana type craft appeared. And yeah. this yep. guy came out with a weird smile saying he was a searcher and he was searching for something. He was actually, I feel, searching for this entity, this this karma machine. Well, then you had that whole thing with the UFO and the, 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 the Mothman and the men in black showing up and the bridge collapse into the river yeah. at Christmas time. And the fact that that whole area there is dotted with ancient Indian mounds. And then yep. on top of it, you have a union carbide plant. Well, let, I, what could I'm be more special than that? I'm tripping on this whole thing because in the car on the way home from work today, I was listening to Robert Phoenix talk about these a, a fire in West Virginia in a plastic in an old old Dupont plastic factory. And for some reason, when I was listening to that, I knew that we were going to end up talking somehow about Mothman tonight. And so when he brought that up, I was like, "Oh my god!" Well, it's already... interesting, you know. It reminds me. I probably need to get Andy Colvin back on. Andy grew up in Point Pleasant, and he was yeah. there during the events. 
and he's part of the Mothman Festival that they have down there, which I need to go to that one of these years, get down to the Mothman Festival. How awesome would that be? That would be really cool, actually. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, but I, 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 I digress. Sorry. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, but I, I feel that it's some sort of ancient Tibetan spell that was released, or some kind of uh, astral tulpa that somehow ended up in this dimension and released. And um, it's funny because for the movie, the Mothman prophecies to be made. Uh, Richard Gere actually got permission from the Dalai Lama for yeah. some to do that. Yeah. Well, so he's, why would he need he's in, permission? He's into that whole thing. Like he's into the whole. He was into the whole Tibetan movement, the Save Tibetan, Free Tibetan. It's an movement. interesting question. I never thought about that. Why did he need permission from the Dalai Lama? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Interesting or an interesting or. Well, and also that they would because it goes back to Ra's earlier story about the the monk on the mountain. Yeah basically bringing in this gigantic owl form right yeah. well and also just then that that richard gear who's someone who's very invested in the whole uh, tibetan culture and and that he's been part of all of the you know sort of social movements to save tibet and free tibet and whatever that he would end up playing the mothman in the movie right? yeah. and, and the men in black thing i mean in in to to my family lineage we we have a, a name for this it's called the capinera and the capinera go back hundreds of thousands of years, if not hundreds of years, if not thousands. Um, we call them the Capinera, but basically what they are is even hundreds of years ago to my ancestors, if somebody appeared to have hidden knowledge or they were uh, some kind of individual that looked like a healer or a psychic or a dream seer, or they spent a lot of times in the woods alone, these beings would appear sort of out of thin air and they would always be dressed in black, sometimes out of... Uh, attire that would be like a little bit out of fashion like uh they would appear like in biblical robes if they were in the 1600s they would all appear in like this biblical black cloak or if they would appear now it would be like in a suit that was like a little bit out of time yeah you know or something like this and they're they're basically time jumpers and i feel that they're responsible like for actually, the observers they're, they're and like fringe. i was just gonna say that they're like they're like the, i was just randy at this i gotta point, see fringe the same person you've this, gotta I, watch fringe see the, all the listeners to this show what you need to know is you need to sit down and watch seven seasons of Fringe, and then you will have some understanding <laughs> well, of where you, and how our minds come from. If you watch seven seasons of Fringe, tell me where you found two extra, because I've only ever seen five. <laughs> I'd love to have two more. This <laughs> actually is the <laughs> secret seventh season. Yeah, <laughs> Randy's hiding that from me, then he only gave me five. Huh? But, um, you know, I was just thinking that same thing. Like that, the, That's what the observers are in Fringe. They look like they're wearing suits from, like, 1950s, and they're basically they they basically exist sort of outside of time or in the future, and they're able to jump into time at different points. Yeah, and that's the way it's portrayed in the series. It yeah. Basically, you you come to understand it's like what Ra was talking about earlier, you know, with the the, the time jumpers or the. Yep. Uh, these are people. These are beings that drop in and out of timelines. Mm -hmm. Yep. And they're doing it not for not for diamonds and gold. They're doing it for artifacts and information and to change information yes. and to change things. They're, yeah. they're doing it to re, to, re -edit, to sort of like t take a snippet of the roll of film and replace it with something else. They're doing it to re-edit the film. Yeah. 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 Re-edit the script. Yep. Yeah. The splices. The splices in the uh, film. Definitely. Yeah, Definitely for sure. And, you know, I, I think that they might be responsible for what we when we found the Nag Hammadi and they, they might be even responsible for what's going on and, and the cover up of you know uh, that. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. That's another one of those things. How convenient that, that the Nag Hammadi shows up. Yeah. Right at the right after World War Two, right get, at the height of all the of uh, of everything, yeah. Yeah, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi are discovered pretty much in parallel. This is all right around the time that you have the post World War Two UFO thing ramping up. Right. You see rifts just open. I mean, we're just they're just ripping rifts open everywhere, shooting off a bombs everywhere, and and it's like. You know, people don't appreciate or realize the circus that the world was from the 1950s through the 1970s. I mean, the Cold War era was bizarre. And 
there was all kinds of wild energies wailing about. And in the midst of all this, there was a lot of supernatural shit that was just off the rails that, you know, if you look in the fringes of history, you'll find them, but it's not talked about a lot. And except that UFO researchers and people who are dealing with the paranormal look into this stuff and they begin to notice the rise of high tech is concurrent with the rise in this magic that's, that's permeating us now, both good and bad. Yeah, I mean, you're right. And, and I feel that those of us that have come in and, and like if it's the 144,000 of us, that we've been deliberately chased by ones that have been taken over by, by the dark side or if you want to call it yeah. dark forces. Hell I mean, even, yeah, as a, as a hellhound, you want to look, yeah. Even, even uh, you know, as a kid, like I was having dreams, uh, reoccurring dreams, and I didn't realize who these weird people were in my dreams till years later till I grew up. I mean, some of these dreams were with L. Ron, uh, had L. Ron Hubbard in them. Mm -hmm. you know, and and I didn't know who this was. Some of them had Madame Blavatsky and, and things like this in them. So I, I, I feel it totally is some kind of ultra intelligence that can all of a sudden appear as ascended masters, have, have you, uh, appear have, as, as certain like things like this. Have you looked at like the um, whole thing with like uh, uh, L. Ron Hubbard and, and Jack Parsons and Aleister Crowley and yeah. the creation of the moon child? Like yeah. that's that I've, I haven't had a chance to look as deeply into it as I want to, but when I look at like some of the circumstances- I have of, an article online about that. Babylon world, yeah. Of the my Babylon birth and working, my childhood yeah. and whatever, like it feels to me like that is some, that is some, like a role that I was, you know, they were attempting to cast Well, and they did it at Palomar from of all places. It's been done a few times. It's yeah. been done, yeah, it has. It's still continuing, you know, they're still yeah. continuing the Babylon workings and, you know, to bring in you know, well, well, Marjorie Cameron, they made her like the, 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 red, the red harlot they talk about in, in ancient Babylon, you know, the, the scarlet harlot, the, the scarlet whore, you know, that's going to come in and, and host the, and have this, this moon child, this, this, the new sun god, if you want to call it. Hmm. But when, when you, this happens to you, you're making some kind of pact with um, the triple yeah. goddess. You know, yeah. you're going to become the crone. And Marjorie Cameron became the crone. She literally became the crone. Yes. yes. For yeah. sure. And yeah, I've looked into it. And L. Ron Hubbard, um, like I said, when I was a kid, I was having this reoccurring dream of like a, a, an evil man, like with this really mad face and his hand would be glowing red and he'd want me to touch his hand. And you know, everybody would always like, somebody would always rescue me out of the dream or come out of the dream. And later on in life, I, 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 uh, you know, saw that Ionetics was the first time yeah. I saw who he was. Yeah. yeah. And I saw the face and it was bone chilling when I first saw yeah. his face. And he's, he was trying to, I think, astrally abduct me for. Well, Dianetics for is, actually, is actually a blueprint for mind control. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it is, you know, and people forget now that Hubbard worked for naval intelligence and he worked through naval intelligence right through the founding of Scientology. Well, hey, Rod, hey, Rod, I don't know if I ever told you, the hospital that I was born at is now the Church of Scientology, the celebrity wow. center in Hollywood. Yeah, like, you know what I mean? I, I too, I, you know, I've had some sort of uh, um, a dream and astral sort of run-ins and, and other run-ins in my life with the Scientologists and L. Ron Hubbard and that kind of interesting. It is, um, you know, almost... I don't know how to explain it, like a stalking kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it I feel stalking. It's I feel psychic that he, stalking. Yeah. He, I feel that he, um, inter, his, his DNA had been interweaved with draconian magic, some kind of draconian ancient serpent magic. Because even when I viewed him, one time I tried to view and think about him and, and see if I can like get a psychic vision of him or whatever. And what I saw was... Him, him turning like an angry purple and red, a dark red, a fierce red and black. And there would be like a storm emerging from him. And then I would see like a long feathery antenna coming from his brow, almost like some a dragon. And, you know, like a, if you um, manifest a draconian energy, a draconian air dragon or a storm dragon, that's what they look like. They look like these, these, these draconian energies. And, you know, they would they would be able to manifest storms within themselves and within mm -hmm. other people. And mm -hmm. he was a, a manifester. He was able to manifest things, you know, and he called yeah. upon, I think, an ancient draconian energy. And he 
summon the eye of Leviathan, and he got certain powers within himself and was able to enchant people. And that's why still to this day, 30 years after his death, people worship him like he's a god. People still talk about him as like he's a god because he had some magical powers within himself that he summoned. And, you know, there's a price for that. And I, I'm sure that when he died, um, something was waiting for him because even I had a, a, a dream one time where that same man that I saw with that red hand, I saw him like in bed dying and he was screaming, yelling at people to burn him immediately for, Oh, you need to burn me, burn me. It like woke me up. And I was like, it was so real. And his fate, he was like screaming for people to burn him, you know? So like, is there some, there was something waiting for him. And I've had little glimpses of, of that in my life with, with certain people, even, um, with like, uh, John Ritter, uh, before John Ritter died, right? Listen to this. Before John Ritter died, I was living in Long Beach at the time. It was two, 2002, this is 2003. This is very interesting. Okay, I can't wait to hear this. Let's yeah, see. yeah. So, like, uh, I was, I had stopped drugs, right? I, I didn't do any drugs. I, I used to party when I was a teen. I, I had gotten clean. I hadn't done drugs. I may maybe smoke a joint from time to time, but, but I wasn't on drugs. I wasn't under the influence. I hadn't been up for days. None of that. Um, all day long. In my head, and I hadn't thought about John Ritter since Three's Company. You know, I hadn't, you know, he was far from my mind. Um, I was living in Long Beach. It was, uh, I could find the exact date because uh, when he died, it was the night before he died. And I didn't know anything about him being sick or anything about him dying. I don't think he, I think he died spur of the moment too. But, he did, he did, he did not. Yeah, so yeah. he hadn't thought about him in years. And in my head that night, I had three roommates at the time. We were all home. We were all in the same area where the TV was that night. And that whole night, I kept saying, um, I was like altering. Do you know the, when Ritter died? Somewhere Se in 2002 or 2003. September 11th, 2003. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I was in Long Beach. So it was September 10th, 2003, right? I know they almost, they, they filmed the, the movie Bad Santa around that same time too, because it was right on the same block I was living at. Um. Like there's a good Santa, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so they, uh, they, um, that night, everybody was home with me, and that whole night in my head, I kept hearing this song, which was like a, an altered version of Three's Company. I was hearing, "Come on, knock on my door, we're waiting for you. <laughs> Come on, knock on my door, we're That's waiting crazy. for you." Right? I yeah. was hearing that in my head all night, and what I was seeing in my mind were these three creatures, they were in formation, one high, one low, one high, one low, like that. They were in formation. There was three of them. And they, I only saw them from like the shoulders up, but they were in black and white. And their head was like a flame. And oh, my God. It was like a flame head, right? And they were swaying there. And they were moving like, come and knock on my door. We're waiting for you. And their eyes were like see-through, but blackish white. And, and they were just flame headed, right? But it was black and white. And so I was saying it over and over. I was saying it out loud. They were like, shut the fuck up. That's not even the words to that song. <laughs> like, shut up. They were yelling at me all night. What's wrong with you, right? So the next day, um, I go out and get the paper. And I get the paper and I see John Ritter died. And I'm like, holy shit, right? So I go back to the house and I showed everybody the paper. And they were like, oh my God, what are you? They were like scared of me. You know, because like, what is wrong with you? Like, that's not a coincidence. So I don't know if he made some kind of contract and something was waiting for him or something, but something was waiting for his ass. Uh, wow. Okay. So you want to send Trippy? Yeah. Um, the last TV series that he was on, or the, that was, my cousin was on the TV series with him. Um, it was called Hearts of Fire. Really? Yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. It, it was, I mean, it was a... Um, like a Linda Bloodworth uh, Thomason for show. They were the same lady who did um, Evening Shade and uh, uh, Designing Women. And, my cousin was, uh, and they, they played a couple on that show and it was called Hearts of Fire. That's symbolic, huh? Right? They're, this always have a, but I don't know. Well, I just have to tell you, well, ever since the first time that you contacted me, I remember <laughs> I was sitting in the airport. I was stuck in an airport for nine hours and you contacted me on Facebook. And I, I could tell you felt connected to me from them, but you and I were chatting, you were making me laugh. I, I feel 
and we didn't we didn't really get a chance to get into some of our musical stories but i feel very energetically connected to you yeah, I, yeah. Like, it's weird like I, it's all, almost an awkward energy where you're like what the hell like why do i is, feel like this like, yeah some of the things you've been describing like when when you were talking about them i can't explain it they i there was like this weird thing going happening in my head I don't know, but like you also, I mean, you're one of the only people I know that has an energy level that is at the same, like same kind of <laughs> level as mine. Yeah, I work 12 hours a day too. Me, right. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I run six miles a day. I work full-time job. Yeah. I do all this kind of stuff. I can't sleep either. I just can't Me shut either. it off. Even when I go into the bathroom, like the, while I'm waiting for the shower to warm up, I have like three books in there with me. I'm, yeah. I'm, That's I'm like a thing. Al- oh, he's just exactly yeah. like me in that respect. <laughs> <laughs> the reading, the reading room. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I, I don't know, but it's weird. Like, I feel like even just that day, like, I was sitting there with talking to you in the airport or whatever. I don't know, man. Like, I, and I've heard you, and, you know, we'll have you back and we'll maybe we'll just have an episode where the three of us go through some of our strange experiences with music yeah, and other we'll things we'll or whatever. Um, but I feel some kind of, I don't know. We'll have to, I mean, I, I, maybe I'll have you do a, an oracle reading for me sometime or yeah anytime for i would never would never charge you guys anytime you would want yeah i, I just want to see i just want to see what comes up and just sort of it would be really and also it'd be really interesting to meet you and just see like how many like how what the energetic resonance is because it's so much energy you know what i mean like it's yeah, what we need to do is we need to do a road show and we need to go out and just yeah we should we should go meet all of our friends raw we'll go up to the hudson river oh, valley yeah. and where raw lives and we'll put an the event Phantom together Shores. yeah yeah <laughs> we should, we that's should. a place i'd like to go anyway i've never spent much time up there in the hudson valley but it's beautiful yeah it really is it really is um i got but a yeah, couple if we, if we do a show on friday during a day like i can uh i we could like i'll be here by myself like we could do it i'll have i don't work on fridays so we can like really spend some time together and really do it right cool yeah cool what uh there's a couple of things i want to touch on real quick because time's running out here on this show um one of the things that that we're kind of in the quest for now is to find authentic magic again and to be able to reconnect to the things that are really part of who we are and what we're supposed to do we can't do this without another level where are you at in because i know you're i know you're working in this realm where are you at and what are you seeing what are you sensing what are you getting in terms of us being able to initiate, initialize, not initiate, initialize the next level that we need to get to in terms of even like the workings, the good workings of magic. Well, it, it all starts within the heart. I mean, some say it's in your solar plexus that it keeps it anchored, but I think it's it's in the heart. It's actually in your your heart chakra, and it's it's if you want to call it chakra, whatever you want to call it, but it's it's it starts in our heart. And actually appreciating the words and the wisdom that you speak within your higher self and to your higher self, and get to know your true abilities and what you're truly capable of. And you know, like like you said, your oversoul, your higher self knows what you're truly capable of and i feel that we're on the cusp of remembering who we are as a collective species you know and it's right now is the most crucial time for us to activate and remember what's just buried within us and you know shamanistic ways um have been hunted down from the beginning of time and of course there's there's some that go down the dark route and some you know that that give it a bad name but to become like like chris geo even says like to become like your own shaman yeah you know that's truly what it's what it's about is to become your own healer your own and there there's magic within all of us we are magic you know um and to be a magician is to be your own healer and to be a a magician is to manifest good around you and within you. And if you, if you can't, um, if, if most people, especially in this alternative media scene, if they can't even be a judge of character or a judge of themselves, how can they even show someone else? Cause you see like most people, they're very naive. They're very, uh, gullible. 
they're you know it, it's like in most people they, they they can't even they don't even they can't even see like what what they are themselves or and and they're helping people spiritually and i feel that we're not far off of achieving what we need it's just that there's only going to be a certain amount of us that actually remember and mm -hmm. become who we're supposed to be and the others are are completely walking around like automatons yep. and, and and drones because uh it's it's just it, there it's it's scary and, and it hard it has to do with like you said with magic and <sighs> The church, the Vatican, places like this are performing witchcraft on people, mm -hmm. you know, on a daily basis. And yep. our whole society has been enchanted and our metaphysical world has been enchanted. I, I don't know if I ever brought it up with you guys, but if you take Sedona, Arizona, right? <laughs> there's, a, there's an ancient. We were just talking about this. We were this. just talking about Sedona yesterday. It's an ancient place. It has a lot of good sure, power there. It does. But it has a lot of dark power there as well. Yeah, we well, were just having this conversation exactly that yesterday. This is a, this is key to what's happening on our world right now. Is in this area and and certain places of power like this because these there places is, are being taken over by darker forces. Yeah, and there's a grid that's happening. Yeah. So like, what I recommend too, like what you were saying, what can we do? You know, where are we? There's certain things that we can do. I mean, there's certain things that we can experience. I mean, there's we can do simple spirits that like when when you have ley lines or, or dragon lines, whatever you want to call them, energy, places of energetic power, you can actually put like stone spirals or make some kind of stone. You're gridding. You basically yeah. grid the sacred a, place. Yeah. Yep, yep. And put a flat stone in the middle. That's what I like to do. Put a yeah. flat stone in the middle. And, and you can actually open up gateways and open up portals and take that yeah. hijack it back, you know? And there's, um, there's, there's ways to, to overcome this. And that's why... Um, things like orgone and and all these these things are are, are looked at like they're they're evil, but uh, we can actually you know fight this and it's it's not too far off. It's just that we forgot who we are. We forgot how to be shaman. We forgot how to be healers. You know we're going to the doctor so then they give us some pill. They grind it up in a factory and made out of all this garbage. I mean none of that is is worthwhile none of it is worthwhile you know it's actually programmed yep witchcraft in those capsules whatever yep. you want to call it it's programmable programmable matter yeah programmable yep. matter it's 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 there we go again you know, that's what it is <laughs> Absolutely. it's yeah. they're they're taking over you and they're they're hijacking everything that that our ancestors had worked for you know and there's uh like i don't know how much time we got but I mean, I could do a whole whole story. Yeah, thirteen minutes and four seconds. <laughs> I mean, the the portal thing is is a uh, a big deal because that's our way out. You know, that's our way to these other ways of experiencing where there is no time, where where the barriers of time don't exist. Is when we yeah. find these other realms of existence, the other realms of who we are. You know, all of us have as many um traumatic events as many bad deeds as many bad thoughts as you and your ancestors have is as many lower realms that are within you and as many good things that you've done in your lifetime or possibly can achieve is as higher as your realms go so you know uh, these things can tap into the most lower realms of you and bring that out of you and leech it and 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 suck it and drain it out of you and you know most people nowadays have been drained and lulled to sleep by this ancient force you know and if we start to remember who we are and remember the places of power on this planet and we take these places of power back we can align the grid so it's a place of spiritual power again and not a place of darkness because all of these ancient sites they were once a, a grid of, of spiritual power and then these ancient giants and ancient um ancestors that corrupted our our world i feel darkened it with sex magic and different rituals like when i view stonehenge or i view certain ancient sites like that i see massive giants having ritual sex on top of stone slabs that's what i see mm -hmm. 
you know so i think that our sacred places were hijacked by these dark entities these 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 mad bloodthirsty energies and they are actually from another realm i feel the giants they're they're not like what we think they are they're from other realms of existence yeah. that like i said they push themselves into matter on this realm and then they're once they're here they're now subject to the realm the realm's laws they'll they'll, they'll have to feed their hunger they'll have to feed their sexual ap appetite they'll have to feed all their desires because now now they're in this material world and they're subject to these laws here so that's why you have stories of giants like fergus who had sex with dozens of women and, and ate like seven deer and seven pigs and all this stuff in one sitting because he had all this insatiable hunger now that he's in this material world and he has to have these material desires. And, you know, there's a tale that goes along with that with Lake Nemi, where my ancestors are from. Um, Lake Nemi is an, an ancient volcanic crater. It's 19 miles from the, the Vatican. We actually call it Diana's Mirror. Um, and it's not just because the moon is reflected on it and it looks like a mirror. It's actually because there's a, there's a portal beneath it that my whole lineage has been built around, is protecting secrets regarding this lake. And this lake has been kept secret for thousands of years. There's tunnels beneath the lake that's connected to the Vatican and secret areas of the Vatican. It's guarded by, psych by psychic guardians and what they call the Gregori. They, they guard these entranceways to these portals and um, Caligula actually went mad digging tunnels beneath this lake and accessing the portals beneath this lake. And he received technology and he released some of the Goetia Goet demons. The Goetic demon, yeah. 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 yeah there, was, there, there was demons imprisoned beneath this lake in an astral prison that he released. And they incarnated, one of them incarnated into um, us that they called them Saint Barbato. And he was actually like uh, running the town. He was the, the figure from the church that was running the town at the time. And Caligula released one of these demons who learned how to incarnate in a human. And the Goetia demons, actually his name was Barbatos. And he's one of the Goetia, one of the 72 Goetia. And he incarnated as Saint Barbato in like 660 AD in Benevento, Italy. And he went to go take an ancient walnut tree that was a sacred tree to all the shaman and my family in that area. And it was a tree of prophetic um, power. And that tree was actually what was in helping in prison. It was a technology to keep this demon in a, in a prison, these demons in some kind of astral prison. It was said to be this walnut tree was connected somehow to a technology that kept them in some kind of prison. And they were released and they incarnated. And this, this Goetia demon incarnated in St. Barbato. And he took down this walnut tree and built himself a, a, a church pew out of it, you know, for that church and hijacked well, the whole area. That's interesting because if you look at the walnut, the walnut is the shape of a brain. If you look at the actual nut. And so he took down the tree and built a church. And they've been controlling the brains of mankind with the church ever yep. since. That's yep. fascinating. Yeah. Very nice, very nice dissection there, Emily. Yeah, very good. For sure, that's exactly what happened. And you know, and Saint Barbato, um, he was never heard from after this incident. He took down this tree in 662 A.D., and then you can't find him any anywhere in the record books anymore. He, he live. He he lives in the brains of all humankind. He's completely. Yep. He is. He is the brain parasite. That's fucking fascinating. Wow. I'll never eat another goddamn walnut again. <laughs> <laughs> Walnuts are actually good for you. <laughs> They're really that's good for you. Was, yeah. Wow. That's, that's fascinating. Maybe that's a good note to wrap up the main show on. I think Raw has yeah, agreed to do a few minutes is. of after show for us. Yeah. Uh, Let's do this. Let's, uh, first off, um, let people know about your radio shows, your website, yeah. YouTube channel, da 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 da. Yep. Uh, you can find me at themysticalspiral.com. Um, you can find everything there. My my email address, if you want readings or anything, is moontribe712 at Hotmail. Um, I have two radio shows on Friday night. It's at the Para X Radio Network. It's called Spiral Radio. It's Friday nights at 8 Eastern. And on Saturday nights, I'm at tfrlive.com. And my show is called The Eye of Ra. It's from 7 to 9 Eastern. And if you subscribe on tfrlive.com under The Eye of Ra, I get some of the proceeds. It helps keep this train rolling. And um, 
you know, I do free videos all week long on YouTube and I also do my show Friday night for free. And um, I always have free information on my site. So being, buying a subscription really helps, you know, for $5 a month, it, 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 it actually helps me out a lot. And um, what else is there? Uh, exploring the car with Rock That's Costaldo YouTube. on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. His, his morning videos are really cool. And if we can all just start talking back to Rob, we can work on our tele, telepathic. It helps me get through the day at work. It's like, but is there traffic when you're driving? Because you seem <laughs> amazingly focused on that camera. I'm thinking, you never hear him slamming on the brakes. There's no, <laughs> no people going by with their finger hanging out the door. You, I mean, you, you go know. to work really early, though, don't you? You must have a great work? commute, yeah, brother. Yeah, I leave, I leave at sun, before sunrise, yeah. By the time yeah, I get to yeah. work, the sun's rising. Nice, wow. nice. All right, that's going to wrap up this segment. Um, there's probably a secret package that will come out of this as well on the Patreon site, so you might want to get to. For the juicy juice. See, see if you can grab some of that. The levels are there. It's uh, patreon.com forward slash off planet media, right? Off yep. planet off media. media. Yeah, so you, you guys, I really want to thank you for letting me come on and, and, and sharing some time with me. I really had a lot of fun. We'll this has been again. great. We love yeah, hanging with you, man. Yeah. All right, that's going to wrap it up. The truth is out there. It's inside you. Now uh, go for it. Get it, get it. This is Off Planet Radio.